curate introduction and start with that. That, that sounds good. <laughs> so, um, what am I doing? I'm, uh, yes, uh, I'm gonna give a tutorial on um, some basic, um, you know, reinforcement learning models that people apply. Sorry? Um, uh, it's true. Oh, uh, got it. hold on. Um, Is that, yep. is that what I want? And is, uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh so, uh, this, uh, this tutorial is going to be interesting. It's going to be on, um, you know, <laughs> some basic, applying uh, basic reinforcement learning models to a trust game and sort of scaling them up a little bit in, um, and it's going to be interesting, not because maybe the content, but because I actually know nothing about like Jupyter and Open. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, wrote the thing in MATLAB and uh, converted it to Python. And then my, my student created this, uh, you know, Jupyter Notebook uh, setup. So I'll, there'll be lots of things that I don't expect here. And we'll, you know, you, you guys can help me uh, figure out what I should be doing here. Um, Okay, but the uh, the the basic idea is we're gonna build off um, the um, trust game that I showed a little bit in my talk, um, and the uh, the setup. Um, I guess I guess I'm gonna just keep moving through this thing as we as we talk here. So um, the setup is that we're gonna um, generate some code so that we're gonna play a trust game with n partners for k trials, right? Um, and each player is gonna, um, the, the, we're gonna play with opponents that are uh, not actually interactive. Um, so this is modeling the like simple version of a trust game that we give to, um, you know, a participant in the lab. Um, and, you know, I think obviously there's extensions to the model that, you'll, that we'll go through here that, you know, you could do if you wanted to model the interaction component. Um, and I think, you know, I'm happy to chat about this. So the, um, uh, the, we're going to make two basic models of the same task. And then what, what you're going to see at the end of the day is the three enforcement learning model and the uh, Bayesian model are basically the same. We tweak one thing in the um, reinforcement learning model is this is going to be the Bayesian model. Okay, so uh, on each trial, a player is going to, um, you know, uh, either invest, I'm going to either invest zero or one dollar. It's going to be multiplied by M, and then uh, the partner is going to return R dollars. Um, and, and that's going to be drawn from a distribution that's specific uh, in this case to the partner. Uh, if, you know, we're, we're going to go through some reinforcement learning models and some Bayesian models. If you are excited about these ideas and you want to talk more about them to me, you should just come to me. But if you're excited about these ideas and I'm not here and you want to read more exhaustively about them, these are my two favorite references. So for reinforcement learning, uh, Sutton and Barso is like the, uh, you know, I, I find it really accessible um, and it's you know, the go to source. And for, um, uh, Bayesian inference. I personally like the um, Adam McCoy or uh, McCoy's book, uh, Information Theory, Inference, and Learning Analysis. And really, the the first three chapters of that book are basically, you know, point you in the right direction in terms of making Bayesian inference models. Um, okay, so how's this work? Let's see. I'm gonna hit a button, and I think it's gonna run something. <laughs> We're, we're going to try to generate, uh, you know, some partners to play with, and those partners uh, are hopefully going to have some um, mean uh, level of returns uh, if we invest. Um, and, you know, maybe we did that. Uh, so what we want to do now is uh, create uh, a bunch of trials. So we want to create uh, I guess 
for each trial we want to choose which partner the participant is going to like see and we want to uh, choose the right uh, cho choose a return rate that that partner would provide. So going through and just creating a big list of trials and a big list uh, of the amount that the partner is going to return based on their sort of mean level of return. Um, and okay, so now we just like set up the task. We didn't make any models. So we're going to start by making a reinforcement learning model. And the reinforcement learning model is going to have just two um, key free parameters. So one is the learning rate, like how much are we adjusting the um, uh, you know, value expectations of the model based on the most recently observed data. Um, and the other is the inverse temperature. So inverse temperature is the degree of uh, um, determinism um, with which the values give rise to uh, choices. So if we set uh, you know, the inverse temperature to a really, really high uh, number, then that means whichever action has a higher value, the model is going to deterministically choose it. Um, if we set it to a really low number, then the model's sort of going to be uh, exploring um, all, a lot of actions uh, more evenly. Um, also, sometimes uh, people uh, in, use the, in, the initial Q value of the model as a free parameter because the initial Q value will actually uh, uh, affect the way that the model is going to explore. In a trust game, the initial Q value that you give to uh, you know, investment is essentially going to model the person's sort of initial behavior, whether they uh, start off with investing or whether they start off you know, not investing. In this case, starting off with investing is a sort of strategy for exploring because if you, uh, you know, start off, uh, you know, valuing um, investment to some degree, that means you're going to try the action that actually gives you more information. Okay. So we ran something. Uh, so, you know, the way the action selection is going to work we're going to use this softmax function. Softmax is just basically a sigmoid, and the sigmoid has you know the inverse the the values of the different options multiplied by the inverse temperature. So we're sort of scaling the um, degree to which they're used by this inverse temperature. Okay. Um, okay. So if we actually want to run our model. Um, there's not much that we're going to do here. We're going to, you know, create some key values. The model is going to have key values for each of the available actions. And the, uh, you know, we're just in the trust game going to assume that, you know, not investing has a key value of zero. Because you don't get anything back. In principle, you, you know, you could <laughs> model that as other things, but for simplicity, we'll model, we'll model that as zero. So all we need is to keep track of the key values. And we have to do that for each partner. So we have uh, one for each part. We're also just going to make a list of the actions that we actually chose so that we can go back and look at the behavior of the model at the end. Um, once we've pre-allocated space for some things, we're going to loop through trials. We're going to choose whether to invest. We just use a softmax function. We're going to um, store how much money we invested, compute how much money we get returned, and then compute the profit. Um, so did we actually make money or lose money based on that investment? And that profit is what's going to go in as the sort of reward in the reward prediction error equation. And the uh, thing that gets subtracted off is sort of our expectation. And that's going to be our Q box for that action. All right. So this is the reward prediction error right here. We're scaling it by the learning rate. And then we're, uh, you know, uh, adding it to what we previously had as a key value to update the, the value. Um, can you maybe make the text bigger on the screen? If I feel like maybe see the line. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry. I don't know actually. Can someone? Uh, how do I do plus. this? Yeah. Plus. I'm gonna plus. Yeah. 
better? Yeah, so just maximize that hole. Uh, it's all right. Okay. So yeah, keep doing that because I, I really don't. <laughs> I also don't have, you know, this is my first time giving a tutorial like this. So I'm happy to cater to whatever's more helpful. Okay, so we're, we're walking through. We got a key value. We've updated a key value. This is just, we're storing some stuff. But essentially, then we're going to go to the next trial. We're going to get a new partner. We're going to play, you know, play the game again. We're going to select the Q value appropriate for that partner and um, choose an action. If we choose an action that's investment, then we're going to update our value for investment. Um, so that's a basic reinforcement learning algorithm. Questions as I run it? So just make sure I understand like the number of action space like there's one plus one action for each like partner. Yeah. So yeah, well, yeah basically just it's in that you know, right? It's like the, yeah. the simplest possible. Right. I mean, technically we have a uh, you know, we we could have a don't invest action, but here we're just setting that to zero. Um okay. So right, and your decision. So you start out with some initial you for all of them it's the same right and then because you have a soft max rule you're going to probabilistically choose one of the partners and invest and you get some feedback on you get back and you just continue to do that soft max will steer your actions towards those the highest power mm -hmm. yeah but there's also some chance to explore right? that is that is true yeah yeah okay so we can maybe look at, uh, so I guess we ran. Um, is that right? Okay, so now I've run it. Um, and what I'm plotting here is, so the um, ground truth, like mean return of the five partners that I simulated, and the um, final learned values of the model, and you know, hopefully, you can see that, like, uh, you know, the Q values mostly track the um, uh, uh, mean return values of the, the partners. So the, the partners that were more generous tend to, you know, result in higher Q values for the action of investment, and the partners that were less generous tend to um, have learned, uh, you, you've learned about them, lower Q values for the action of the investment. Oops. Okay. Um. So, oh, I don't have my lines on here. Um. So we can look at how this stuff emerges over time. So, um, the. Uh, so we have our five partners here, and in this plot, it's a little harder to see uh, which partner is which. Um, but we know that you know these partners have the higher return values because they end at a higher level. We know this one had a lower return value, ended at a lower level. And we can see the sort of dynamics of learning over trials. Um, and this is you know because we're using a, a, a small learning rate, we see it takes a lot of trials to learn. So you would in the laboratory would not really run a study with 5,000 trials, um, but we can you know, play with the parameters of the model and then look and uh, see how that changes. But before I do that, so the um, this is sort of an internal variable in the model, right? You don't actually get to see this when you do a study. You don't get to see what the person's Q value for the partner is. What you actually get to see is their behavior. Behavior tends to be a lot noisier and a lot harder to look at. So if we um, actually look at the um, uh, investments of the model, um, and when you look at the investments of the model just for like the first hundred trials, we see that for all five uh, agents, for the blue points here, the models 
uh, you know, not really uh, differentiating between them. Essentially, they're all it's investing with fifty percent of chance in, in every. But over time, we see that the behavior um, maybe that we would like to happen emerges, and it learns to um, you know not invest in this guy and invest in. All right, um, so there's only two parameters in the model, so we can look and see what happens when we change them. Um, so the first thing that we can change is the learning rate. So if we increase the learning rate of the model, We don't change much in terms of like asymptotic behavior. So final, sorry, that's not behavior, final Q values. Um, but we sort of make all the learning happen in front end, right? So now it's like learn fast, and you can see it's sort of bouncing. If we Looked a little more carefully, we'd see that the variability in the um, partner returns are driving these sort of like you know, fluctuations. Maybe. Um, and right, did I run? I must run this. And then if we turn up the learning rate, we see, well, actually now there's not really a big difference between what the person is doing in the you know, first hundred trials and the last hundred trials. They're basically figuring out that uh, they should you know, not invest in this person and invest in this person um, right away you know, within the first hundred trials. And, and you know, if we look closely at this learning curve, you know, we can compress obviously and, and start to focus here. But often in these like trust games, the learning is really fast. Um, and you, you don't see uh, you know, slow you know, slow learning rates. But you do sometimes see in um, past the half a lot, a lot of stimuli. And maybe it's worth noting now um, that like we talk about reinforcement learning models is playing an important role in pivoting between um, biology, where we know something about how reinforcement learning is implemented, and we, um, you know, uh, you know, think we know something about mechanisms and uh, you know behavior in humans, where we can't necessarily always measure the like things in the brain that we we care about. But there's this sort of like sometimes false sense that a parameter in a fourth learning model is capturing the thing in biology. But in many times what we actually see in these tasks is that if we convert enforcement learning model to behavior, we'll see really, really high learning rates. And uh, if we um, do something to the uh, behavioral task so that it, uh, you know, we force the person to who's performing the task to use uh, cognitive resources to do other things at the same time, the learning rates drop per precipitously, right? So like um, a lot of what we pick up in a term that's called the learning rate in a task like this might actually be attributable to other cognitive factors, you know, usually working memory is like a common call. The eps I mean, in, in principle, episodic memory might also um, play a role. Okay. So that's a basic reinforcement learning model. Um, we can make a, I guess, we can do Bayesian inference on the same task. The task isn't particularly, you know, complex to um, write down a, a Bayesian inference model. Um, but in any task, we're gonna, uh, the strategy for Bayesian inference is gonna be that we write out a generative structure. So we say how the data are generated, and then we're gonna invert that with Bayes' rule. Um, do folks know what Bayes' rule is? Is that something? Okay. Um, we, right, when we do that, we're gonna have to make some assumptions about what the model knows, and then what the model is gonna infer. And the demo is gonna 
assume that the uh, model has some expectations about the standard deviation um, uh, uh, over you know, returns that an individual will give. Um, you know, in principle, that is not really, you don't need to do that, but you could. If you wanted to, you could infer both the standard deviation and the mean at the same time. But the point here is you have to choose what, what the model is going to know and then uh, what the model is going to infer. And typically what the model knows becomes part of the generative structure that gets inverted to um, infer the other stuff. Um, okay, so let's see what's worth saying here. So there's lots of ways to to, to actually implement Bayesian inference. Um, in you know, in many cases, we know if we can assume a distribution, we can often um, do the actual Bayesian updates on the sufficient statistics of that distribution. Here, I'm going to do something a little different, which is just um, actually take the uh, you know uh, discretize the space and um, compute the uh, you know, probability distribution over that discrete space just for uh, convenience of plotting stuff. Um, but this also happens to be like a, you know, a pretty cheap and easy way to solve a lot of um, problems sort of, uh, yeah, especially if you don't know what the distributional form of something is um, or you know, don't know the, yeah. Okay, so we still need a way to select actions uh, in the Bayesian model. So I'm going to assume uh, the same. I'm going to also assume that we have an inverse temperature um, and set it the same way I did above. Um, and let's see. So yeah, we're going to assume that we have some space over which people can return. And uh, we're gonna keep a probability distribution over that space. Um, uh, apologies for LaTeX, but I don't actually know. So we just we're we're just gonna do Bayes rule, but like to interpret the you know um, we just want to infer the mean of the return rate distribution that is a hidden variable that describes this partner based on the um, rate, uh, you know, the actual return that they made. Um, and to do that, we, you know, can say, well, what is the likelihood of getting that return from various, uh, you know, mean distributions? You can think of the mean distribution as being something like the generosity of the agent, um, at least the, um, willingness of an agent to return me money in this particular game, in this particular situation. Whether it means generosity in other situations is sort of like a higher level question of generalization. But this likelihood, this is a known variable that we can write down. And then the um, prior probability on uh, means is something that, you know, we can start with an uninformative prior, and then we can sort of update it recursively over trials. The denominator is essentially just to normalize the probability distribution. So in practice, we can just divide by the sum of the numerator and we don't really have to worry about that so much. Um, okay. So, yeah. So to do this, we're just, you know, gonna make a big flat probability distribution. We're gonna, um, And then we're going to start running through trials. Each time we run uh, through a trial, we're going to um, choose an action. Um, so we'll have the model invest. Oh, actually, so first we're going to take this probability distribution, which uh, has, uh, you know, this is P mu is the probability distribution over possible like mean investment rates of this individual. And we're gonna, uh, you know, for each possible mean like investment uh, level, we're gonna multiply that by its probability, add those all up to get the expected value of this person's mean, right? Um, 
and, and then I'm going to compare the that expected value to the amount I have to invest, and that's going to be my action value. Um, so I'm going to stick that action value in the soft max in the same way that we did before, and then um, I am going to. What am I going to do next? I'm going to yeah choose whether or not to invest based on a probabilistic soft max. And then um, if I invested, then I'm gonna update the uh, my posterior probability distribution um, by saying, well, I, I know what the likelihood of uh, the return I got was, and I'm gonna multiply that likelihood by my prior, and then I'm gonna know this. Okay. So questions on, you know, Bayes? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. There's no transition statistics. It's just like, you know, that's it. Yeah, and you can add anything in here, right? And so like, I'll show you. So the third thing that I'll show is like one where there's actually complex generative statistics. So like, you know. Um, you know, where, where you have to bet, basically track the, that over time. And this transition function can be anything. Um, but, you know, it's a little, it, it's, sort of a different approach. So with Bayes, you really sort of have to, you know, commit to some generative structure in order to invert it. So it's not like, I think a lot of the methods that people have talked about are more like data-driven where it's like, you're sort of more like trying to figure out what the transition structure is. Um, and often, you know, the way we use this is we'll design a task that embeds a certain transition fu function that we think is potentially interesting for some reason. And then use this as like a first step to basically say like, you know, what would the ideal observer do given, you know, Bayesian influence on this uh, transition structure? And then, you know, usually that gives us a sense of the things they're doing that make sense and then the things that they're doing that don't make sense. <laughs> um, it's only a starting issue. Okay, so um, we can do... Uh, the same, this is its own thing. We can look at some of the same things we looked at before. Now for a Bayesian inference model. Um, so the, again, the ground truth, um, you know, uh, amounts returned sort of track the, um, uh, expected return values of the Bayesian model asymptotically. So after we've done like a ton of trials, um, we uh, what we might be able to see if we look close, if we look at it, some early trials, is we see initially early on the model has a wide probability distribution. So when it you know has only a small amount of data in it. You know, as it, you know, we observe more uh, interactions with a given individual, that probability distribution is going to get narrower. Yeah. How do you deal with it? Yeah, like what is your way of dealing with it? Essentially, so um, if you want to prevent that new information, you have essentially no effect anymore and later. Which I think is particularly important in social interactions. Because yeah. So I didn't hear, but like if you if you wanted to like, so one thing that people standardly do is this, and then assume that this is um, like just some normal, uh, you know, uh, you know, the sampling statement would be that mu sub t plus one is uh, normally distributed would mean mu sub t in uh, variance sigma. And then this sigma essentially um, con controls the degree. Oh, yeah. um, 
that stigma controls the degree to which you're um, uh, your um, distribution is expected to widen between trials, right? So basically, if I come in with uh, this distribution on trial T, then on the next uh, trial, like it's going to get a little wider if I have a generative process that assumes that the mean is slowly drifting over time. And that's like, um, often people will use a comment filter, which uh, has sort of a, um, yeah, has a um, like nice analytical form that basically does this exact thing. So I'm doing this to that question. I, you're looking at me like you're puzzled. So I think I, did, I went a different direction. No, I think you're right. I think that's like what I always uh, struggle with. And I think that if we uh, eliminate the Bayesian properties in a way, right? If you if you are your spread of the distribution, it's kind of altered set in a way. I mean, that, that oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. In, in this, so I mean, so like you feel like that's like ad hoc to just like add a. No, I don't. I like. I, I do the same. <laughs> uh -huh. I was wondering what um, like uh, because I was like, let's say you have a heated distribution, for example, then then you have your sampling your two observations that you can make. Mm -hmm. Um, then that determines both uh, the central tendency and the spread of your distribution, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a fully Bayesian process, but then if you, for example, your spread is then something that potentially is a free parameter or. Something like that, then I feel like you're getting rid of half of the Bayesian process. Or um, well, well, essentially, what, what you're doing is like just putting in the, the mean or the mode or whatever. I, I, I don't I mean, so I should say, like, you, you're you now considering a um, joint distribution, not just the like a, a, ba a distribution over mu, but you're considering a joint distribution over mu sub t and mu sub t plus one and that is like if you're willing to say like i i want to bake something in to my knowledge over that transition function i think it's you know it feels you you can define that and say what would be the bayesian update under this generative model um and you know and it could be a normal distribution. And I think it will, like this same approach works with the beta distribution. I mean, there's like the, you know, Barron's 2007 um, paper that basically does that. So the lowest level is a beta distribution. And then they have, you know, a drifting drift uh, stack of um, distributions on top of it. And what they do is instead, you know, they don't throw any of that information away. They just hold on to that like three dimensional distribution. Um, and so you're slowly learning about where you are in this, you know, in the higher dimensional space, which essentially is titrating the degree to which the lowest level beta is getting wider between trials. Um, yeah, and I mean, I'm not like arguing necessarily like, for this approach, but I, I think because like that was not the right generative model for the test. <laughs> that they ran either so it was a little bit ad hoc and like it, i definitely agree that there's like an ad hoc flavor um but it i don't like i think as long as you you play the game that like i can choose whatever generative function i want like there's a basic solution to that generative function um and you know i think that's maybe part of the answer of like it's hard to falsify Bayes or, you know, some of these other like wide models because like, you know, there's almost people running entire research programs that are sort of assuming the model is right and saying, well, I assume that people are doing the Bayesian update on some generative model. And my research program is just to figure out what that <laughs> generative model is, um, right? And, you know, whether or not that's like a good, epistemological strategy is very, very open for debate, but like in principle, you could do it, I think. Um, okay. So we get distributions, they get narrower. Um, um, what's the point here? Uh, okay, so we uh, we can learn some stuff. Oh, I, I yeah, this is, so, uh, our Bayesian models and RL models actually doing something different. So um, in, you know, 
In this simulation, I had like a little bit of a trick in there, which is I also ran an RL model, um, but I ran it on the choices the Bayesian model made. And I uh, just scaled the learning rate by one over the number of previous observations. And uh, uh, lo and behold, that model, uh, you know, does exactly the same thing as the Bayesian model. So they're not, you know, you have to like find cases where, um, you know, RL and Bayes are actually different in order to like, yeah. <laughs> and, and frequently, like, it's like this, where like, if you tweak one thing in the model, like for example, in this case, the, the learning rate to make it more dynamic, then you can get one model to behave exactly the way that the other one. Okay. Um, all right. So that's modeling one social action, um, sort of inspired by the uh, work that um, I presented um, in collaboration with Oriel, we'll consider another social action. Um, so I might want to invest in, per in a person. I might also want to borrow someone's toothbrush. It's a weird thing to do, but maybe I want to do it. Um, and maybe just say I don't know anything. I don't know anything about you know um, whether people like it when you borrow their their toothbrush and then just try it on one person <laughs> uh, and uh you know i i try it on my you know new, new friend from my summer school and then i you know <laughs> they don't like it and then i get a negative prediction error um and so if we use the model that i just showed you then you would then go try it on another person <laughs> but that feels not quite right <laughs> Right. So like uh, it seems like we should do some generalization and, you know, there's different. I mean, the, the question of like what we should generalize and what we shouldn't generalize is like a really good one. And I don't know the answer to that, but I what we'll go through here is a case where if we know something about the, you know, if we can define some things about the environment, um, uh, Bayesian model will tell us, you know, what we should generalize. And I'll also show you that, you know, you can basically get the same behavior from uh, um, RL model by uh, making a small tweak. Um, uh, okay, so we want to do, so we're going to start off by trying to think about this um, in a Bayesian framework. Maybe the right thing to do is draw a game. So, um, we're going to assume that there's some, you know, population level uh, you know, analyst reaction when you try to on average uh, borrow somebody's toothbrush. Um, and uh, you know, we can sample some individuals who, you know, come you know, to the, the mind summer school. Um, and, you know, they may have their own um, uh, personal uh, feelings about toothbrush borrowing and whether that's, you know, an okay, acceptable thing to do. Um, but we'll assume that they, you know, come from a distribution and the um, parameters of that distribution are defined by some, you know, high level population. And then we can assume that we, when we actually, um, you know, uh, borrow somebody's toothbrush, they have some reaction to that, and the uh, um, their reaction is actually the only thing that we can observe in the entire general model. Sorry, now Maria, I you, you guys are not can see this at all. So that's the, the general model we have in mind here. Um, so there's a couple of variances, variances that matter here, right? So, um, you know, mu, so B, we're going to say is uh, normal with um, B used to P, and maybe we'll say sigma P, like the population variance, like the high level variance. And then there's also, another sampling statement in here, like 
you know, x comes from a normal distribution is, uh, let's give us x, x is b. Right, so we have two levels of variance, like we have a high level of variance and a low level of variance, and both of them will matter for how much we generalize. So if we have something uh, like toothbrush borrowing that like generally people are in agreement we shouldn't do, like the population variance is quite small, <laughs> like, right? And, and if we have something that people, you know, completely don't agree about at the population level, I don't know, politics, something, then this variance would be quite large. And in, in you'll see in, in the, these are the factors that are going to affect the degree to which when I learn about, you know, person A, you know, I see the reaction of person A, do I generalize it to person B? Um, okay, so these are... So we, we're going to um, include our different levels of, uh, of variance here. Uh, we're going to, you know, assume that we interact with two people who don't like their toothbrushes borrowed. We're uh, going to assume that we get a negative response when we actually try to borrow someone's toothbrush. Um, and then we're going to just start computing um, uh, use, using Bayes' rule to update uh, our probability distribution. So we start with a prior over means. Um, we uh, then when we observe um, an, an outcome uh, x, so this is the negative 10, we're going to compute the probability of, uh, you know, uh, probability distribution over mu sub a, given what we just observed. Um, now, uh, whoops. Hard to get there. Ah, no, that's actually a matrix. Uh, yeah. Actually, can I? I should visualize this. Yeah. 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 Visualize this. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> So this, this is what it looks like. Uh, and if you want to plot it. Do you want to read? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. There you go. Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, what we're looking at here is the, um, you know, for a given population, mean, what's the probability that we get a partner mean? And this thing, you know, is going to be sensitive to the, the standard deviation in the set, right? Um, and uh, all right, so um, now we're going to work our way up, though. Now, now we're actually going to say, okay, we observe like a negative outcome. I want to infer the um, mean of the partner who, uh, who, you know, punched me in the face after I borrowed their toothbrush or whatever. Um, and, you know, we compute that in uh, exactly um, this is like the simplest form of Bayes' rule, although A little bit of Greek to me. Is this Bayes' rule? Do people I think it's it's like the equation for a normal distribution? Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. I'm looking. Am I looking at the wrong thing? The partner response given partner mean. Oh, I see. We're uh, partner. Oh, 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 oh we're we're looking at the likelihood. Ah, I see. Okay. 
What's the probability of uh, the partner response given uh, a given a, given a partner mean? So we're saying, all right, what's the probability of distribution, uh, you know, over axes given mu? So we're again looking at some. So we're defining the um, you know generative terms here, and then. Uh, so if we now we've you know we we know what this relationship is like we know what this relationship is like now we can actually use you know both of these steps to compute the um, information about the population given what we actually observe uh, and you know the nice so the the key part of this generative graph is that we can exploit the um, Directed connections is providing some information about conditional independences. So, like, what you what can get tricky in Bayesian models is when you have uh, you have lots of things depending on lots of things, and we have to create a really big probability distribution that spans a lot of dimensions. But in this case, since each of these things is you know, since X is uh, conditionally independent of mu on um, uh, mu sub p on mu sub a. And we can we can do each of these little um, uh, sampling statements and likelihood distributions one at a time and sort of work our way all the way around. I heard this the thing you just visualized, but now I think I, I think it is as well because I think the first term before prior to this is probably the likelihood. I think that's the likelihood times the prior. Yes, this is this should be the prior. Uh, yeah, so this is the, 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 the likelihood here, right? So this is the sampling statement there. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, this is what happened <laughs> when you translate your code via GUI, <laughs> chat GPT, and then... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Seems good. Checks out. Um. Okay, so we we have so all right. Uh, did I run this though? I didn't. I didn't run it. So now we went up here, and then, um, well, then when we just multiply by the, um, we know how we get from here to here. We have this this statement, so we can deal with that. Um, and then we should be able to look at so something that maybe is interesting. So. In this case, we started with some prior that was like, I, don't, I think people don't really care if you steal their toothbrush or something. And uh, then we observed something that was like, ooh, this person really did not like it when I stole their toothbrush. Um, we computed a um, posterior distribution, which is like we computed in exactly the same way um, that we did inference uh, in the trust game. Which is to say, we're going to update um, our mean um, on the you know person A based on what I observed, right? And that's the red curve. Um, but then what we're doing is you know considering the fact that well actually uh, we can say something about the population mean based on what we observed here because we know how those two things relate to each other. And the way that they relate to each other is like this, right? So if we know, you know, something about where we fall here, then we'll know something about what the population is like. Um, let's see. Uh, right, so partner mean, oh, sorry, population mean. So th then we've got to the, the pink curve. So now we've learned something, not just about a person, but about people. Um, and then uh, if we want to know something about a different person, then we know that essentially we just have to say, well, we know this is what people do. And so what would we expect if we sampled a person from this distribution? Um, and, you know, essentially since, you know, in this case, they're all Gaussians, it's going to be like adding uh, some variance into the Gaussian distribution as you see it. So how much variance you add? Well, that depends on what you assume about the underlying uh, you know, beliefs of people. If you think people are all the same, 
um, then you don't have to add much variance at all. Um, if you think people are all different on this particular feature, then you add a lot. And that turns out to be sort of the major factor in terms of how things generalize. So if we um, you know, change the um, population standard deviation to be you know, quite large, I think this works. Um, So that's actually useful. So like basically we we observe one individual and I'm not telling us much about uh, you know everybody else. Um, oh, shit. And now uh, you, you know you can see um, I get some reaction. I see well. Um, this partner, I've learned, you should not borrow their toothbrush. Um, <laughs> um, but like, you know, I mean, I've barely nudged my distribution over what people like it if you borrow their toothbrush at all. Um, and, you know, I'm totally willing to try this again. I would, I would borrow Jeremy's toothbrush and see what happens. It's not, <laughs> it's not, it's, you know, maybe just like a hint of a shift to negative valence, but not very far. Right, so basically, like our, you know, what what Bayes is doing here is basically saying like things about the world that we expect to be true across all people um, are things that when we observe them in one person, we can then in you know impute that for a value that we can use for all the other ones. Um, things that are you know going to be totally different across all people when we observe it in one person, where you know. We shouldn't share it across people. And, um, you know, the nice thing about this framework is you can do anything in between um, and we can sort of arbitrary, it, you, you know, we can parameterize the thing to go either way. Now, the question of what things people do generalize across and what things people don't, or how to get like these actual quantities from real world interaction data, I don't know the answer to those questions. Um, okay. So how, how my time was? Do you have a question? Yeah, I mean, I guess I was gonna ask you something about like the last thing you said, what you said, so maybe you can't track that. <laughs> oh yeah, but uh, how to do it in the real world or? Yeah, it's like, it, it's, so you, you basically use this model. Lots of humans and then these kind of things. Seeing with people, even like kids, um, like they're very promiscuous in expecting things to generalize to other people. Um, so, like, uh, there's this like pathos in these experiments that they kind of sell them that, that like, Basically, like one shot inference of like, I'm daxing, I'm daxing, this is what daxing is. And then, like, if another person comes in and is like, I'm daxing, it does something different, it can, it'll be like, that's not daxing. Yeah. It's like a totally, it's a convention, right? Like, daxing right. is just the, it, it's arbitrary. So it feels like they're, at least for really young kids, that parameter is like jacks. Uh -huh. I'm really close to like, once you've seen one person, you've seen a lot. Uh -huh. um, but then it seems like for other domains, like how do you, is there some kind of like meta learning attempt of how you like calibrate that for different domains? Well, I I mean, I think there's like a um, stability, I'm sorry. Uh, um, yeah, I think there's a trade off, a complexity trade off where like the amount of data that you have is like affecting, you know, essentially like Occam's razor. So, like, as you, I mean, if you have limited data, like, I mean, even if the real world is this super hierarchical model where like only something generalized, whatever, that model, like if you learn on that model, it won't actually do better than a model that's much simpler, right? Um, because, you know, you can't possibly, um, you know, learn the things that you need to make that model uh, useful. Um, and there's, 
you know, DJ Paulus Brumani, who is, uh, you know, <laughs> at Penn has done a bunch of work on this where you, um, uh, you, you know, in, in, I think there is empirical evidence now that, that people also do it is they'll prefer a simple, simpler model early and then they'll shift to a uh, um, more complex model and they have sufficient data to sort of, um, uh, you know, give that model an advantage in terms of uh, model preference. But uh, you could imagine, I, like, I don't have like a real answer, but you could certainly imagine that if you have like a mental model or even competed multiple mental models and you have one that's like very small number of parameters, like in children, it might be doing as well as the complex model because they have limited training data and because, you know, you have this trade-off in terms of like, the amount of data you need to to um, make a complex model work, um, whereas like presumably with sufficient training data, the model that's going to do be the best job in terms of predicting the world around you is going to be one that's sufficiently rich to capture the interactions, but then you know ideally sufficiently simple that you can train. Yeah, that's the right. Unit that it's like. Maybe start out with like a estimate kind of thing, like just like almost the data on, you know, that uh -huh. all the variance is the same. Yeah. And then you've argued that, like, at a certain point, you've seen enough variance that that doesn't explain it. And then there's some kind of shift thing where it's like, oh, there's variance in the social wells, and I just need a Gaussian instead of a Gaussian or something. Or, like, I mean, yeah, I've been trying to think like what we could put. Some kind of like hyper prior group, right? That sort of, it's almost like structural discovery. Um, yeah, like over almost a different, yeah. So, yeah, because the way I framed it was like, I was like, oh, imagine you have these competing models and you do inference on them, and then it's easy to think of how you would then you just have a probability distribution over models. And uh, probably within mo each model, you're inferring the uh, probability over parameters, right? And that's actually a little bit like the third model I was gonna show, but I couldn't get us to work in Python and we're <laughs> kind of close on time, so I'm gonna uh, skip that. But um, maybe we should talk more offline because it feels uh, relevant to things that we're thinking about. Um, I think you you also could, do an optimization thing where you actually tune the model, like the way you're saying. But um, I think, you know, yeah, you, you could also do a sort of like mixture, you know, a mixture model approach where you just like have all the models and you arbitrate between them. Okay, cool. All right, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs>